Hey there friends, David Lightbringer here. Thanks for clicking on my video. And you know, with House of the Dragon hype in full swing, I figured it was a good time to make a video about Daenerys. That's right, makes sense, doesn't it? What this video will be is a continuation of my argument from Twitter. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's gonna be a concise explanation of why Daenerys and Jon are the heroes of the story. And why we know for a fact that the books will give us a totally different ending for John and Danny than what we saw on Game of Thrones. So toss me a like for classic A Song of Ice and Fire content, and let's talk about heroes. You know, there's a lot of bad people in A Song of Ice and Fire. George calls them gray characters, but it must be a pretty dark shade of gray, I sometimes think, because honestly, a lot of the story seems to consist of folks doing bad stuff to other folks, both to other bad people and to innocent people. You may have noticed that too, so does George R.R. R. Martin just like writing about misery? Is he some sort of literary masochist or sadist? Does he think there's no such thing as a hero? No, no, of course not. What George likes to write about is people struggling to do something about the awfulness and brutality of the world. Those are his heroes. My own heroes are the dreamers, those men and women who tried to make the world a better place than when they found it, whether in small ways or great ones. Some succeeded, some failed, some had mixed results. But it is the effort that's heroic as I see it. Win or lose, I admire those who fight the good fight. So yeah, it almost sounds like a sports cliche, but what George is focusing on here is the intent and the heart of the characters when defining heroism. Trying to make the world better in small ways or great ones is what makes a character heroic. The part about most had mixed results, well, that's the story. That's what he's actually writing about, the difficulties and struggles of trying to change the world. But first and foremost, and no matter the results, George is calling the effort heroic. After all, no one person is ever in perfect control of the outcome of anything. But positive change has to start somewhere, and it's good people standing up and fighting the good fight that gets the ball rolling. So in case it isn't clear from the title of the video, I think this quote about heroism applies to Daenerys and Jon more than any other character in the story. I'm kind of singling out Daenerys a bit because, of course, the Game of Thrones show turned her into a monster. But I'll be discussing these two heroes in tandem today as well because George seems to have written their heroism largely in parallel. Between Jon's efforts to reconcile the wildlings to the rest of Westeros and Danny's efforts to destroy the slave trade, nobody else really comes close to trying to change the world for the better on the scale that they do. These acts go beyond simply trying to make the world better and actually become revolutionary actions, meaning ones which get into undoing the actual structure of injustice. Jon Snow challenges the customs of Westeros and the Night's Watch, and Danny the customs of the Dothraki and the people of Slaver's Bay. And they do it specifically to make structural changes to the world which make it a better place to live in for many people. Now, of course, my point isn't that John and Danny have some sort of monopoly on heroism. Stannis Baratheon, for all his flaws, does deserve a mention here for defending the realm against Mance Raider's initial wildling attack, and even more so for beginning to prepare Westeros to fight the others. And other characters like Davos, Brienne, Sansa, Samwell, and so on, quite often do strive to make the world better with the opportunities that they're given. John and Daenerys, though, they really are the purest incarnations of this heroic ideal in the story. They repeatedly put their lives on the line, and John gives his life to carry out this ideal, and they stick to it through thick and thin. It's no coincidence that John and Danny seem destined to save the world. They've been proving their heroism since the first book, when John stood up for Sam against bullying, and when Danny used her new power in the Kalasar to upend Dothraki tradition and shelter prisoners of war from rape and slavery. Those trends have only continued as the story has gone on, and that's what qualifies these two to save the world, far more than any prophecy or bloodline. Those sort of magical destiny type things are really just parts of the story that support who they are as characters. It's quite telling that it is the 15-year-old Daenerys who best expresses the heroic ideal for the kings and queens of the story. And that is, of course, her famous quote, Why do the gods make kings and queens, if not to protect the ones who can't protect themselves? So it's a simple idea, but it's important to understand. 
Danny has her priorities in the right place. She's trying to make the world a better place by using her power, her political power and her dragon power, to free slaves and to smash the slave trade, to protect refugees and to care for the sick. She sticks around in Slaver's Bay after the revolution to try to sort out the mess because she cares. These are the things that make Daenerys George's idea of a hero. Jon is showing the same sorts of qualities and moral values, and that's why he and Daenerys will make a great pair, whatever kind of pair they eventually become. Again, not because of their blood or their ability to ride dragons, but because of their shared values. Okay, well maybe a little bit because they can both ride dragons. <laughs> But Mr. David Lightbringer, you say, and I'm sorry, I know you don't sound like that. Didn't George R.R. R. Martin tell Dave and Dan his ending in like season three or four or something? Isn't it likely or at least possible that Danny will also go mad or murderously tyrannical in the books too? No, and you're banned from my channel now. God. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. These are, of course, very logical questions to ask. Even though the creators of the show, Dave and Dan, and the author of the books, George R.R. R. Martin, have given us this answer, many, or even most people who may be watching House of the Dragon right now and Game of Thrones three years ago, probably don't hang out on the internet all day reading interviews and Twitter threads, which is fine and probably a healthy life choice. So uh, let me see if I can very quickly and clearly lay this out for you so that you never have any doubt ever again. So basically, what happened is this. Yes, George told Dave and Dan the broad strokes of where he was headed with his ending during season three, which is 10 years ago now, if, if you can believe that. However, after D&D got past season four and the Red Wedding, they stopped adapting large parts or even most of the book material from A Feast for Crows and my friend here, Dance with Dragons. And instead, they increasingly went in their own direction. They also stopped consulting with Martin, which is something that George has mentioned a lot. I think he's, he's a little bit broken up about that, a little bit hurt. So what we're left with on the Game of Thrones ending is that Dave and Dan took some of George's older ideas and then did their own version of them. And in other cases, they came up with their own ideas entirely. And guess what? It's not that hard to sort out what parts of the ending came from who, at least for some of the big stuff, especially when they tell us. Around season three, we went to visit George R.R. R. Martin, and he writes, and he kind of figures things out as he's writing. When we went to visit him back then, and this is while he was still writing book six, <laughs> he's, he's still writing book six. He didn't know yet where the story was going, and he knew a few key things, and one of those key things was that the final king at the end of the story would be Bran. All right, so that's clear enough. The general idea of a King Bran as the final king came from George. It'll presumably be a bit different in the book since the TV show version very much downplayed the green seer magical elements of the story. But yeah, in some form, Bran will be the final king. King of all Westeros, king of the God's Eye, king of Brantopia, king of Branistan. We can speculate on all that, but nobody else will end the story as the reigning monarch of Westeros. We know that much. Now, on many occasions, Dave and Dan have mentioned these three very surprising plot twists that Martin told them about during this meeting in season three, which they refer to as the three oh moments. Those three things were Bran becoming king, Shireen being burned, very sad, and also very sad, the Hodoring of Hodor, or whatever you want to call that when Bran's spirit existed in two times, bridged them together, and accidentally fried Hodor's brain. Now, you'll notice something. Uh, Danny going mad and burning thousands of innocent people alive isn't on the list. Wouldn't that qualify as an oh sh moment? I mean, I'd say so. And also not on the oh sh list is John murdering Daenerys or stabbing her in any way. Because, of course, some have suggested that a more magical Azor High like version of John stabbing Danny could be in the works. But again, I say that that would still be at least as shocking as Hodor, Shireen, or King Bran, right? Shireen's burning, in particular, while completely horrific and almost unwatchable on TV, was very heavily foreshadowed. So it's not even that D&D &D could say that they're big Azor High fanboys with Azor High rules posters on their bedroom walls and therefore saw John killing Danny coming and weren't shocked. No, anyway, you slice it, both elements of Danny's ending 
her turning her dragon fire on hundreds or thousands of helpless, innocent civilians, and John murdering her, were utterly shocking. I mean, even if you expected all that to happen and weren't surprised, these events were still shocking. Heck, the shock factor is probably a large part of what D&D were counting on when they wrote this ending. And write it, they did. That's right, it's not on the oh shit George, why are you such a sadistic bastard list because it's not anything that George told them about. None of the broad strokes of the John and Danny ending were George's idea and we know that for a fact. I think the final scene between John and Daenerys is something we came up with sometime in the midst of the third season of the show. The broad strokes of it anyway. But there was a tremendous amount of pressure to get it right because we know that this is not a scene that's giving people what they want. All right, so the broad strokes of the final scene, John having to murder Daenerys for the good of the realm, in other words, are something that Dan and Dave say that they came up with. We've seen that they're pretty quick to tell us when something is George's idea, but this they say that they came up with. Okay, so now ask yourself this very important question. If the scene with John killing Danny that we saw on the show was just a slightly different and perhaps poorly set up version of something that George told them about, would Dave and Dan really be able to go around saying, we came up with it? No, of course not. I mean, George would be sitting at home going, hey, that was my idea. How come they're saying they came up with that? If it had been George's idea for John to kill Danny, then Dave and Dan would talk about it like they did the King Bran thing, and they'd say something like, back in season three, we met with George, and one of the things he told us was that John would kill Daenerys at the end. Now, I would assert that this applies not just to John killing Danny, but also to Danny's heel turn in general. John only needs to kill Danny if she's become some sort of an awful tyrant, so the two ideas really work together. It also doesn't really make sense to suppose that George is planning to turn Danny into an evil tyrant queen of Westeros and then just to leave her on the throne, especially when we know Bran's going to be the final king. And again, even just the idea of Danny having a massive murderous heel turn would have qualified as a shocking oh sh moment and would have been on the list if it had come from George. And look, I'm about to summarize a 90 minute video in one sentence here, but when you review Danny's story one chapter at a time, as I did, it becomes very obvious that Dave and Dan felt they had to make countless changes to Danny's character to set up their idea for her ending, which is her becoming a tyrant that must be killed for the greater good. These changes were very consistently done to make her TV show incarnation more imperious, aloof, demanding, threatening, and violent. And they removed many moments from the books where Danny shows empathy, kindness, self-reflection, humility, doubt, conciliation, and above all, a willingness to sacrifice herself for the good of others. Dave and Dan had to make these changes precisely because the books do not foreshadow their ending. So in making these changes, Dave and Dan turned the most heroic character of the story into the most villainous. Now, in my opinion, you don't really need these quotes from Dave and Dan and George Martin to know that this was deeply, deeply wrong and not at all the ending that George has planned for Daenerys. But now you have these quotes too, just in case you hadn't seen them. So please, friends, don't let anyone tell you that the ending is going to be the same or that Danny's going to go mad in the books too. Just wait. Now, frankly, most of these types of comments, in my opinion, are misogynist in nature. Not all, but most of them. But of course, Daenerys is a female revolutionary whose character is designed to challenge the reader as much as it is designed to challenge the world around her. I really am sorry that some people can't see past the sexy dragon lady exterior or the very tired out, oversimplified maxim about power always corrupting. But the truth is, of course, that Power reveals character far more than it corrupts it. And in the books, Danny uses every bit of her power that she gets from the first book to the last to protect people and to fight injustice. She really is a revolutionary in every sense of the word. And sometimes revolutionaries are sexy. Pretty people can take moral stands too, right? I mean, right? Right? So, throughout all five books, Daenerys Targaryen is consistently manifesting George's heroic ideal, even if the results don't always go perfectly, as we said. And if you think that George Martin created the greatest character in modern fantasy fiction to be utterly heroic and self-sacrificing for five books strong, only to have her violate her most deeply held beliefs at the climax of the story, well, he didn't do that.
Uh, I don't know why that seemed like a good idea to Dave and Dan, but the important thing is that this was their idea, and nothing that has anything to do with George's plan for Daenerys and Jon in A Song of Ice and Fire. The real ending of Danny's story hasn't been written yet, and although George does seem to be on weirwood time when it comes to finishing these books, he does absolutely still sound very fired up to tell us the end of his story, especially of late. And when George does write the end to Danny's story, we should expect that it would be something that fits as a climax to her character arc, which so far has been that of a revolutionary abolitionist hero who does everything they can to change the world for the better. Final point, George often speaks of his ending as being bittersweet, right? And I think that John and Danny's struggle to save the world will continue to come at the greatest possible cost. Remember, John is lying dead in the snow right now. And Danny is wandering around bleeding and delirious in the Dothraki Sea and coming face to face with a Kalasar led by a Kal that hates her. Consider also that Danny still needs to let go of the idea of conquering Westeros and to grab a hold of the idea of using her dragons to instead save the world from the Long Night. And until she does that, she will absolutely continue to struggle with the moral dilemmas and collateral damage of waging conventional war with dragons. But you know what isn't bittersweet? Daenerys murdering the people that she sought to provide a peaceful kingdom to and then being put down like old Yeller by the other hero of the story who was supposed to be her true love. <laughs> that's, that's not bittersweet. That's, that's just horrific. And that's, of course, how it felt to most people watching at the time. And these three lonely little dots over here on the right, uh, that's the fan opinion of the last three episodes. So look, I realize that I sound a little soapboxy and emotional about this, here at the end especially. But that's because I resonate so deeply with these heroic ideals that John and Danny and others represent. And to watch Dave and Dan completely miss the major aspect of Danny's character and instead turn her into a monster seems like an utter defilement of basically the major theme of A Song of Ice and Fire, that heroism is trying to help other people. Their ending basically felt like taking a crap on the very idea of trying to change the world. And in fact, they were pretty open about their disdain for, quote, liberation ideology in interviews after the final season. But the reason I made this video isn't just to wave my hands around for Danny's cause yet again, but instead to create one short video that should hopefully erase any notion that Book Daenerys is headed towards a similar end as on the show, and which clearly demonstrates that George has written Danny and John to be the primary heroes of the story. So I hope that's what you took from this, and please help yourself to the rich and luxuriant Daenerys Targaryen playlist, which is packed with all kinds of theories, predictions, and analysis of this heroic character that we all know and love, Daenerys Targaryen.